had a conversation on Instagram this morning and then we just decided to just speak five hours later. Don't you think that's really great? It's amazing. It's it's the new, uh, It's the, I was going to say it's the new normal. No, it's the new abnormal. It's uh, the new world of, uh, you know, global connectivity, isn't it? Yeah. But I also think it's really amazing that we just took a chance and we just, yeah. I put it out there and then you said, yeah, that's really good. And then I said, well, there might be today. And you said, yeah, I'm doing a long journey, but how about it? It's fantastic. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, strike while the iron's uh, hot, as you said. I think that was a great thing to do because then you, you catch the energy wave, you know. I know, because we really had a good energy wave this morning. It was it was a really good thing. Um, I want to know exactly how the drive's going and whether you're listening to music or what you're listening to. Uh, what have I been doing? I didn't really listen to any music on the way, actually. I've been listening to a bit of um, podcasts about, uh, I mean, there's a friend of mine recommended a, it's crazy, but it's the Great War podcast, the Dan Carlin. It's a deep dive into uh, basically a whole setup of how that all, the trench warfare sort of stuff, which is just, it's harrowing and disgusting, actually. And it just reali- it just makes me realise what, people can do you know when uh societies just just completely crumble into that kind of uh world it's just it's just too devastating to even describe it but um yeah it is, it's a, it, it's also good for long drives because but also it's it's horrendous and it's harrowing and, and awful but actually it's real you know it's, it's real. real it's yeah truth is stranger than fiction absolutely um yeah so uh and, and you know, it's amazing to think that things that have happened have shaped literally things that affect us, you know, societally today from those times. It's unbelievable to go back and realise that, you know, I mean, things like, you know, there's uh, what what is now NATO and some of those sort of peace treaty areas, they were set up for the first time following events that happened at that time. So, you know, it's they they may not have been called the same thing, but they were the same sort of, ideas in the same area in the Netherlands and things like that so but then don't you think it's interesting that we got this society we want this society to just feel better and to be better and to and to pattern in a slightly different way don't we and we think yeah. well every day that we live and all the things that we do and all the things that we say um as a collective and also individually they are shaping exactly what's going to be happening in the future and yeah and this is now and this is now and mm. and we need to learn from trench warfare. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot to learn. And, you know, the the sort of most bizarre thing is that history seems to always repeat. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's like you've sort of, it's amazing how quickly generations seem to sort of forget. But I guess it's that sort of myopic, you know, short-sightedness, I guess, of sort of not remembering unless you actually kind of have the will to sort of go back and check it out. So, uh Yes. Know, it's, it's good for me to do this at this stage in my life, I guess. Why at this stage in your life? Uh, well, uh, look, I, it's just it came to me from a friend who said, check it out. But I think that uh, I guess it's, you know, I guess if I was at the start of my life, I wouldn't have, I guess, a feeling of, being in a midpoint in a weird way age wise or something do you know what i mean there's something to look back at to kind of sort of say how would i have felt different about it if it was just i was in my early teens or something versus at the end of my life as well it's a kind of it's a it's a nice time to be sort of thinking about it i guess because i've still got the potential and energy to maybe build that in and i don't know that's really true yeah. but the fact yeah. that it's resonating now in in the summer and well, it's the summer here it's not quite there with mm. you but actually you've you've dipped into our summer quite a lot haven't you um but i still think it's interesting because you just can't tell when something's going to resonate at all i think i want to say to you before i forget um that i think it was in that amazing time that people are going to write about for centuries in 2020 and um jacob just said you have to see this you you just have to see this because you are just going to get this. You're going to get this in such a major way. And um, we still laugh at the videos that Jacob showed us at that time. Um, so actually, if listeners have not um, listened or watched <laughs> your vibrato 12 second and your um, don't be born, 
You oh just my have, gosh. I know, but you have you have to go there. And actually that brought us so much joy. Um and I think for me personally, I just thought this is so lovely and so refreshing that you can <laughs> that you can that you can um feel off the wall and be off the wall, but you can make it universal because that's it's in a very selfish way that's how i feel i just think gosh there's all this kind of craziness that's within but i think when you can get it out there and you can share it in a way that you do boy it's just life-changing well thank you for appreciating it i guess it was sort of it was one of those things that was kind of come it came out of a pretty despairing time wasn't it i mean it was sort of you know especially in australia we had i mean look everywhere had it was, it was just shocking it was a global thing and it was yeah. such a strange collective sort of uh, standstill on a lot of levels. And, you know, uh, us as musicians, you know, we all sort of felt that 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 sort of uh, your identity was totally changed because it was sort of like, well, you can't do what we do. You no, know? that's so, right. But it wasn't uh, it's it's funny because p- yeah. you, you could have said, um, um, our identities were taken away, but they weren't. They were just changed, and they kind of morphed into other things. And um, we had to give in the world in a in just in a different kind of a way. Yeah. But is that when you were? Because I don't know when you made those videos at all. I have no idea. Did you make them around that time? Oh, absolutely. They were just sort of almost like a, you know, whenever they were made, I just put them up there straight away. You know, I guess it was that impulsive nature of social media. You know. Um, and I was thinking short form sort of stuff, um, partly because of the tension spans of social media, but also because sometimes it was more, uh, you know, to have that sort of bite size mm. format to it. Mm. It was more like, I guess, sort of something like a, you know, the advertising slogan of the day for people who were basically losing their minds yeah. around the world trying to work out what was going on. Yeah. Because it was just a bewildering time for politics and, you know, the creative industries and all the people that were just losing their minds and having to change the way that they worked and, you know, and then watching the same sort of more and more of the same, you know, uh, merry-go-round of, the announcement okay these are the numbers this is what's going on yeah the experts you know all the stuff it was just it was too it was too bizarre to not sort of respond to that it was a response i think to some of that but then again i've always had a bit of a some people likened it to a bit of frank zapper or something i guess yeah um i don't yeah. know it's a it's a great and wonderful flavor um i want to know how recent you did man oh man well, that's a good question. I, Man Oh Man was a song that I wrote, I started writing in the end of 2020. Okay. Um, and what was actually happening, I'm going to be pretty candid here. I was actually living with a, a partner and she and I, uh, she sort of decided that she didn't want to continue with it. And uh, I ended up moving out of the place we were living. It was actually her place. And I'd been there for three years and um, with a lot of traveling in between and everything mm-hmm. as well. But then uh, it was kind of a very, it was a very hard time emotionally for me. And uh, it was also in the midst of the COVID thing. So it was the first year of what we thought was going to be, you know, a six week, you know, sort of like a Zika virus kind of thing. But then, um you know, many months later, it was like there was no letting up. It was just like this is just going to continue on. And um, I guess I do have a tendency to sort of go into a bit of a, a dark place sometimes with it. But for some strange reason, being at that sort of almost feeling pretty rock bottom, I don't know what spurned on the idea to just sort of make it a, a support song for everyone. But that's really what the song became. But I thought I'd infuse a little bit of sort of, uh, yeah, a bit of bit of the classic sarcastic sort of viewpoint, oh, it's but do it in a very subtle way Yeah. with little kind of little snippets here and there. You'd almost have to pause the video to see what they no, are. That's true. It's really true. But, yeah. but So you can sort of see those in there, and I'm just basically having a bit of fun with that. Um, but at the end of the day, it really was a song to sort of just say, look, um everyone 
a bit like the RE and REM song, you know, everybody hurts sometimes. Oh, yeah. And it was just a bit of a sort of idea of just saying, look, this is, if, yeah, you're not human if you don't go through these sort of things. And I guess it, I didn't really do it for any other reason than that. And I, to be honest, I haven't even put it on Spotify yet. Have you really um, not? And I should have. Well, um, but there... yeah, it was just a, yeah, a I cathartic you... thing, really. And so I'm kind of wondering what it means to be, what it means to be you with your social media presence and with um, the people who know you really, really love you. Um, and I'm sure people say to you, gosh, you could have a wider reach, you know, and you could do this and you could do that and you could post that and you could put this on Spotify. But I wonder how you honestly feel about it and um, how you, yeah, how you are within it, really. I guess if I think back to, my sort of lineage as, uh, I guess, a professional musician, you know, I was making music in venues around the Sydney scene. Oh, for sure, uh, yeah. From around 1996. Yeah. Um, you know, and I guess at that point it was a completely different landscape. Um, well, what did and... it feel like? What did it feel like? Do you mean, do you mean with the band or is this just you? Oh, I'm just both? talking about the way that, you know, media and music and kind of, live well maybe not live shows so much because that's almost been the sort of common thread from then to it now is the, uh, that is the common must thread. have been different too although but in you 19- know in terms of in 1996 people wouldn't have been holding up their phones to you all the time. no absolutely not they were probably holding up cigarette lighters still actually like <laughs> no, old no. analog flame <laughs> completely you know? have the real mccoy why don't you um yeah and they were smoking cigarettes in oh, no. the venues too <laughs> well and all sorts yeah. they were in fact they you know were. my dad used to play shows well, not shows, I guess he used to call them scratch bands. He's, he's a language teacher, but he, uh, you know, used to play a bunch of bass and guitar and sort of things on the weekend. And my mum was teaching a lot of classical piano. And I guess I just loved the smell of that smoke in the Fender Precision bass case. When I'd open it up, I'd go, oh, this is what adults kind of, that's, the, that's an adult venue and that's what that smells like. And there was something kind of like rock and roll and cool about that. And it was sort of, yeah. Um, it's, it's so true, isn't it? Um, I remember going to Ronnie Scott's as a student and it was part of it to come out completely yeah. making of probably very expensive cigars, actually. But yeah. it, was, it was totally part of it. It wasn't something to be embarrassed about or something to be um, worried about. It was just totally part yeah, of it. Yeah, sort of, it was almost like a, an olfactory symbol of fun, you <laughs> yeah. know. And it was just baked in and it was like literally decades of that smoke was in that base cage because that yeah. thing had been around since the 60s, you know. Wow. And, and so I was kind of like, this is incredible, you know. And then I guess there was something rebellious about that which tied in with the rock and roll idea. And, you know, we're talking, you know, melodic songwriters and compact songwriter, yeah, songwriting yeah. forms, you know, coasters, drifters, <laughs> stones. Yeah, Beatles, yeah. Beach Boys. 1996, there's you, there's Ray, and he's getting out there and he's he's gigging, he's doing the thing. Right, okay. Yeah, well, basically, uh, yeah, it was where that kind of thing where the aspiration was uh, to probably get into, you know, a band or some sort of out, outfit around the pub rock scene, which is sort of what Australian music seemed to be, you know, circulating around at the time. Totally. Um and, you know, bands like ACDC and In Excess and Midnight Oil and these sort of things that were in the beer barns back in the day, and some of them had gone global. Um, but, you know, we sort of had that diet of stuff going on, but I was always interested in the crossover sort of artists. And I guess, you know, when I discovered Stevie Wonder and those, you know, guys who were doing, or Joni Mitchell, you know, people that were kind of combining that sort of uh, intelligent writing in very very sort of deep, more, uh, I guess, world-weary lyrics and some of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it was sort of that that's really what got me into it. And previous to that, I was more into I just want to play instruments, you know. I want to be good at instruments and learn the technique of it and do all that kind of stuff and checking out a lot of jazz and fusion sort of stuff. But I guess after that I realised that, um, well, I actually did get a, a record deal with Columbia Records, which was more about selling physical CDs. You know, at that point, we were working up to the year where there were, yeah, they were selling physical media and, you know, there could be a gatekeeper there to actually, you couldn't just walk out with the CD, you had to pay for it, otherwise it was shoplifting. You know, there was no 
copying a file and the very nature of copying a file means now there's two of them and then now there's three of them, four of them, eight of them, a billion of them. So it just was a, a much more, I, well, it was, it, it was almost like the end of a technological era when it had been honed in and monetized and sort of got to its most refined but soon to be archaic point, I guess. So we're talking about LimeWire. Maybe that was late. Yeah, that would have been, yeah, it would have been between 96 and 2000, I think, mm-hmm. you know. And to be honest, I wasn't downloading songs. I was downloading uh, <laughs> plugins. <laughs> No, of you course. know, yeah. like to effects plugins. You yeah, know, yeah. Oh, wow, this is a phaser. Wow, what does this do? Oh, this is a chorus kind of sound. No, this is a sort of emulated tape, taper uh, warmth plugin. This, oh, what's what's compression? What's this all about? I had no idea. All I know is that, and back then I was recording on a, I was recording on a digital thing. I was recording on a, a hard drive, like a, a, a sort of one of those. Uh, was that a Roland? It VS was. 880. That's exactly. And then they had was. a 1680, and then I had an 1880. I had three of them. <laughs> and it then t- it takes you back. This does take you back quite seriously. Real analog faders, no moving faders. You just plug the mics in, plug lines into the back of them. And but I was it. using computers to do sequencing, and you know, just singing over the top of it. And it, I mean, it was very, very similar to today in a lot of ways. But there was more destructive element to the to the way, as in, if you you know, punched in a vocal from here and here, you had to sort of get it right and there was all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I guess I had a pretty crazy experience with that first uh, record deal. I mean, I was studying music at the Sydney Conservatorium. For sure. Um, I was lucky enough to get a, a scholarship to study jazz piano there and I'd done one year of it and then um, Columbia Records had, you know, said, come and meet the CEO, come over here, we're going to make a pop album. Let's see how that all goes. Um, and I had the sort of very common experience where they decided to sort of not put the album out, but through the experience of recording over in New York for a bunch of months and doing stuff like that, I, I realised that there was this whole team of people that was a much more traditional way of looking at the business structure there, you know, manager, record uh, label and yes a booking agent and I sort of realised that they were almost like the three points of a triangle really and the band's in the middle somewhere and switchboarding, the manager's almost like a switchboard to sort of get all of those other people working together. Absolutely. No, that's really well, that's really um, well put. So you And that was what I learnt through that experience, you know. Okay. Um, but did yeah. it make you feel, oh, it's still early days, you see? Well, look, when all of that fell apart in a way, I still had so much energy and I wasn't really crestfallen by the whole experience. I was almost like, for some reason, I sort of had this strange insight, even though I was, you know, I was disappointed on a level. But on another level, I was sort of like, this is such an important lesson to learn that there's this kind of other side. Because up until that point, I just didn't even know that that was an element where that sort of... So basically... We've talked about the gatekeepers and we've talked about the fact that there were these other people in the team. Yes. And I think the big change, obviously the technology is glaringly obvious, but the big change was the fact that you could get that sort of uh, DIY headspace working to a much more exponentially, you know, instead of just getting some music out in shooting it out in a few different rays this way, you could get it going in a sort of spherical, exponential. All, yes, all directions. You know, it went from kind of, squared to cubed. It, it you know did. what I mean? It kind of did, which was totally 3D. When did you realise that you don't need to necessarily have a, a record label at all? Well, I sort of probably in a way had realised that there were versions of that going on even at that time. You know, I realised that there were sort of these... Um, yeah, there were sort of these versions where, you know, sometimes there were these local independent companies which were kind of doing versions of what that For is sure. now. Yeah. But one thing that I did realise is that the artist just needs to be, you know, I mean, you just, thankfully I was motivated, I guess, but the artist needs to be as motivated and you need to be able to believe really what you're doing. Uh, otherwise you can't sell something with authenticity and I guess... When I say sell, I'm not even saying sell to make money. I'm just saying get your idea across. 
in a way where there's a kind of an, a backbone of authenticity. And I guess the best people to do that are the people who've made the stuff. They can talk about where the song comes from. They can talk about where the piece of music comes from. You know, I mean, the, the groove in Man Oh Man to just jump forward 20 years or so was just, I was just, during COVID, I went back to playing piano and there was sort of like this kind of, um, I guess, like a, a, a practice facility in the middle of Sydney and I, you know, I could have gone back to my mum's place to play, but this was closer. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just buy an account there and sort of get some paid lessons. And they had like four grands and 13 uprights and about 30 electric okay. pianos. And they'd have these sort of salons where the people would, you know, play every month or whatever. And I just got to know these girls who were sort of working there on the front desk and said, look, I'm going to cruise in here a bit and just do sort of every few days. Um, and I'd sort of, I actually went back to playing some scales and all sorts of technical stuff, which was fun. And I was trying to apply polyrhythms and modes to them and all this sort of stuff. So there were different shapes and make it as treacherous as possible for myself and all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd end up always just jamming on stuff in there. And there was that, you know, the gospel style groove with that left hand, right hand kind of Montuno y sort of thing going on. And that was not going to be a song at that point I, all it was was just that groove and then I just remember pulling that file onto my desktop on my laptop and then sort of starting to wrap some rhythms over the top and I just thought this is an irresistible rhythm yeah um and then yeah it sort of just went from there so uh, the music actually did come first for that one um whereas other times it's more of a sort of lyrical idea or you know it, it I mean it's just got to start anywhere. You've just got to end up with something, don't you? So you just fill in the, the blanks almost a bit, yeah, a bit like a a torrent file being downloaded or something to go back to LimeWire. Oh, oh it, feels, it feels so good. Um, you've got to start anywhere. That's really true. And I love the idea. But you've got to start nowhere, really, don't you? Yeah. Or you've got to start... Um... You've got to start nowhere, but realizing that actually there's no such thing as nowhere because you mm, are yeah. somewhere, you know, That's and, right. and you are somewhere and, and those ideas are, are in there. And I really like the idea that, you know, you've got to believe in what you're doing because you can't kind of give it to the world without authenticity. I mean, that's just so bang on. But how do you believe in what you're doing? I and mean, you've done so many things, you know, talk about cross genre, which I'm sure we'll come back to later. but. How do you believe in what you're doing? Uh, well, it's a testing thing. I mean, it's every day I'll go through the, the you know, the kind of the roller coaster of emotions that comes with being a creative person. I mean, it's just, and really I, I'm, I do actually feel like maybe you know, this is going to be a, a, a very motivating and stimulating talk, I think, because it's sort of just we're talking about the areas that people do struggle with as creative people, I guess. And, you know, Completely. like I, I go through all the same ups and downs. That's the thing that, you know, what, what sort of struck me the other day, we were playing that show with Lewis Cole and the yes. Metropole Orchestra over yes. there. And there was the beautiful, talented Leanne Le Harvest, yes. who I know Jacob knows as well. Yes. And I'm sure you've met her as well. She's, she's fantastic she's and she's gorgeous beautiful. and she's yes. talented and she's just got this beautiful energy. Yes, she has. And, you know, there she was getting off stage and she was, she was just in the, sec, the the next band room along from Lewis and where we were all, you know, I was literally just trying to take a nap and then I wake up to them, the backing vocalists and her just sort of warming up and I was like, what a glorious way to wake up from a nap, you know, on this travel mattress that I take in my, like, suitcase, you know, oh, good plan. inflatable, you know, like. So anyway, I just remembered her coming off stage and yet again there's a girl who's, you know, I mean, she's successful in her field. Everyone respects her as well. She's got sort of the holy grail. She's got the talent and she's a great artist in terms of what I guess the, the industry would want yes, if true. there's some sort of target there, if there, if that's even a thing. And But then she's also probably even her managers would love her because she's probably creating some some forward motion and there might even be a good financial package at the end of it all and, but then at the end of the day, she's being herself and she's singing these beautiful songs. Yes. And then she gets off stage and so you sort of, you would assume that someone with all of that is just going to be so confident and she's just like, her, she literally said, 
just to sort of someone, it might have been one of the other guys, Sam, or one of the guys playing bass. She was like, oh, hold me, you know, because she was just like, I just didn't feel good about that. And, you know, I was there listening to her going, how could you not feel good about that? But this is the game. It's the inner game, you know, and I just sort of realised that it's just, yet again, I got reminded of this is just what we all go through. And and I think that it's it's part of the beauty of what it is. But I guess, you know, you do need to keep that in check. And I think that... Mm. There's probably, it's a bit like people giving the, uh, you know, the remedies of how you keep your voice good if you're singing on stage or something yeah. night after night. You know, there's always a different way. Some people use lemon water. Some people use, no, nah, it's, you know, you, you grind up ginger yeah, and you no, eat true. that, you know. <laughs> Some people are like, no, no, you, you give yourself the hiccups and you stand on your head, you know. But there's no sort of exact way. It's like a fingerprint. It's that sort of personal. But I guess, um, I guess, look, it's like anything uh, creative or spiritual or the crossover between those sort of worlds, I think you've just got to sort of live in the emotions and let them really be. And, and it's kind of like, you know, the, the bad times or the bad feelings or the sort of, you know, you, you, you can't appreciate the highs without understanding the lows, I guess. So it's sort of that. It's, it's so true. But if we come back to lovely Leanne and um, yes, we do love her very dearly. And uh, she's, she's such a beautiful human being. Um, but the way she kept on saying and she said, hold me. I think what's really good about that is that that's a bit of outreach, isn't it? That's yeah. that she could have just gone to the toilet and just put her head in her hands and just said to herself, that's really not okay. Yeah. But she didn't. She came back into that room and she said, hold me, which is a really great thing because I think other people can really help us get that balance in there. Because again, it is all about balance. Yeah, it's not going to be the good yeah. times all, all the time to go back to your words. It's it's about finding that balance. But other people, I think, do have an awful lot to do with it, if you can believe them. Yeah, well, I think you raise a great point because, you know, my dad used to actually say, Music is, at the end of the day, it's, it, it, of course it's a language and it's all about communication really. And for her to be asking that question as well or, you know, asking someone, like, hold me, I feel terrible about that. You know, she sort of said it in a, she had a smile on her face but that sort of like worried smile that was like, I hope that was okay, you know, that kind of thing. And it was yeah. a, quite a cute moment but it was a genuine thing. She was sort of, there was a fragility there yeah. and, you know, but I guess you're exactly right. Like that was a connection point where, you know, she was, she connected with that person. Completely. And, it, you know, it was, a, again, a, a part of the communication of what music is. It's sort of showing that there's a vulnerability and a rawness there. Um, and I think that that's sort of what, that's what people are drawn to, I think, with, you know, this thing. Because, you know, I guess when we were at jazz school, there was a bit more of a sort of, it's a very jazz term, but, you know, one of the teachers there would be like, we're emotional engineers, you know, and I was like, all right, well, that's a bit sort of, I don't know. It feels a bit, that's a bit, I don't know. It's too, it's too memey, is it? It's sort of like. I think it is really. I think we could draw something really good that goes well with that. I, I'm, I'm not so comfortable with that. I like the idea of the vulnerability being there. And yeah. um, I also like the word fragility. So do you think, do you think that um, every musician needs to have fragility well i don't know if every musician needs to have fragility um i think it's there's probably some important dualities and ironies and sort of counterintuitive sort of things going on with a lot of musicians sometimes the very strength you know and and look it could be said the very strength and power of connection can come through the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. But ironically, also, I think even in just in a sort of purely sonic and technical sort of sense, um, you know, I think that some people, I mean, I'll use a, a pop star example. You know, Christina Aguilera, she's a small stature kind of girl. Yes. With that, this just a massive, powerful, mm. confident voice. Yes. But it's one of those sort of things. It's sort of like you just go, oh, she wouldn't sound like the way that she, I sort of assumed. And, you know, sometimes there's that thing, you know, I used to always look at Taylor Hawkins play drums, you know, the, the yes. late, great Taylor Hawkins. Yes. And, you know, he was one of those guys that played, he was a sinewy kind of 
skinny guy, you know. Yeah. yeah. And and obviously it's all in the wrist and it's all in the kind of the thing. But the it was sort of a combination of power, and you could just tell that he was a laid back, chilled out guy. And he obviously sort of had his had his demons, but there was something about bringing it. Yeah. Which. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was ferocious drumming, but it was just like that was his time to be sort of, you know, I don't know. It was, it, I don't think he could have played with that ferocious sort of style if he wasn't such a sort of fragile Yeah, cat. I love it. Yeah. It's just weird. I just, you just meet people like that and it's, it's very weird. In fact, Lewis Cole, one of my favourite musicians on the planet. It's like we love him too. It's okay. I mean... What's not to love about Lewis? He's no, the, I know. He's just the ultimate. He's just, he's, yeah, when I met him, I thought, well, the drumming's so, you know, it's like it's like this. It's like it's on the edge. It's like always. leaning right always, that way. Always, always. yeah. Or, or is it sliced right down the grid? You know, I used to call him grid god when I first met him because he's just <laughs> like, you know, and every 16th note needs to be filled up. Yes. You know, he's one of those sort of guys. And I always thought he was a fantastic keyboard player and producer in a way, sort of as much uh, as Without a doubt. he was yeah. a drummer, yeah. you know. And now really I'm seeing this filmic sort of writing style that he's starting to get into. I really think that there's so much to come for Lewis, you know. But you'd sort of think with a guy who's got that sort of level of multifaceted talent that maybe his personality and, you know, when you first speak to him, it's going to be a certain thing. And there was a club show that he was, you know, this is well before they started doing lots of clubs and lots of big festivals around the world. I just, being in Los Angeles, you know, I was oh. spending time in and out of Los Angeles. So I sort of went to this club and I thought, I've heard of Lewis and Jen, you know, when they were first doing their first EPs. And we loved it because it was a crossover between sort of funk and electro. Oh, completely, and, yeah. And, and sort of this two-step groove and it sort of sounded like Nintendo Janet Jackson or something to me. <laughs> and I was like, I'm, really I'm going to go and check this stuff out. <laughs> yeah. And then I meet him at the thing and I think, oh, God, I'm just, you know, I'll just have to be sort of, he's going to be standoffish because he's such a musical monster on all of those instruments and he's just got this concept that's so sort of progressive and it's just so fresh. And all the jazz kids are you're so into it. And, you know, he's, he's, he's the young gun as well. He's coming up through the ranks. And, you know, and, of course, I just go up to the guy and he's, you know, he's, he's taller than me and he's this lanky <laughs> kind of dude and he's standing there and wearing this whatever the weird shirt with the weird face on the front of it is. And I just said, hey, man, you know, I'm from, I'm from Australia. You know, we all love you down there. And that was just so cool, man. I'm such a big fan. And he was like, and he sort of almost had this, I almost didn't believe that I could be saying such a complimentary thing. <laughs> and then he just had this, then there was the kind of ultimate goofiness that he came out with. He was just like, oh, but really? Oh, you thought that was cool. Oh, that's great. You know, like, but he's sort of like this sort of, and there was just this humility there that I was just like, oh, of course he's going to be a curveball on what he sounds like. And, you know, Completely it's just. Completely and utterly. And, that's, and that just made me love him instantly even more. So I was yeah. just like, this is just. You know, I think you and I are lucky because we can see that uh, somebody like Lewis, who is indeed tall and big and lanky, um, there is another side. But I think the world views all artists as being just what they see, really. Yeah. On the stage. Um, yeah, true, and I true. Think, and I think that's a that's a complicated thing. I think that's a complicated thing for the artist. Because- it can be. Well, yeah, because in one sense, you want to say, well, this isn't all me. I've got, there are all sorts of yeah. other other facets, but I can't show you those things right now. Um, yeah. But I think instead of the world feeling that, I don't know, maybe the world judges an artist and just says, oh, you're invincible and you're like this and that and the other. Maybe we need to view the artist as being um, uh, absolute, just killing it on stage, but that they've got a real soft side or they've got a great sense of humor or there's going to be something else in there. And I think that would yeah. be just much more sensible because it will give you a much more 3D feel of what somebody could be mm. like. Well, I think that, yeah, it is tricky and I think it can be tricky. And look, on one hand, the sort of reality TV that's offered to everybody in social media mm. now where we can literally, it's it's encouraged to upload literally everything all day, every day. Yeah. Um, and, 
you know, that sort of thing allows people to get, I guess, if you play it right, a real sense of what's really going on on other levels. It's still not, never going to give you the real story no. because it's sort of filtered through the ways that I guess the whole construct of, well, you're watching that in a random access memory filled thing with other things. It's just flying at your face like you're watching the Transformers movie <laughs> with special effects going everywhere all the time. You just like get to the end of it and uh, a session of that and they're like, well, what did you just watch? You're just like, I don't know. It's just so much of every, like, you know, it's just, it's just impossible to kind of comprehend yeah. all of that different stuff in such a sort of non sequitur way. But on another level, I guess that's only made it more difficult yet again for young artists. And I do wonder, um, you know, people who have a good good handle on it, pardon the pun, Instagram handle, but, you know, people who've got that going on and work it all out so it's all kind of going ahead in that in, in the right way, you know, for what apparently we need to use these tools for um, or, or in a way that serves them in a, in a, in a good way, yeah, a yeah. nourishing way, I guess I could say. That's right. Um, is it, you know, is that creating new confusions? And apparently for the self-esteem of, you know, teenage girls, apparently it's been quite detrimental just from what I read. And, you know, there's so there's sort of new social anxieties which are coming out of the whole thing. And if you do get uh, some sort of, I guess it's been good for me in an artist sense to have a little bit of a foot in the in the pre-internet apps world, yeah. As a sort of musician, Why? trying to sort of, sorry. Why? Oh well, Why because it you? it gave me an idea that it it just gives me a kind of an insight into a paradigm which wasn't. It just the methodologies were different, even though Completely. the concepts were probably the same. Yeah. Um, and I guess that you sort of realise that because there's been another and now there might be the current and its evolving self, there probably will be another sort of cutoff point where there's another real chapter. Yeah. You know, and sure. that's kind of, you know, go back to these to podcasts history. about, yeah, history. I mean, you sort of think, you know, you start to realise that countries weren't even called the same thing. No. And, you know, they won't be called the same thing again. They'll change or they might go back to. Yes. It'll be called Leningrad and then it'll be St. Petersburg again. Yes. And then, you know, they, it's crazy. So, and that's in our parents' or grandparents' lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, imagine how the next way or there's got to be something in our lifetimes as a new sort of methodology of how we sort of consume media because it's sort of mushroom clouding out or something. It is you know, mushroom clouding of... out, but mushroom clouds can take a really long time. Um, I don't know how big the shape of this is going to be or how long it's going to be. I have no idea at all. Um, but I wonder because, you know, you're somebody who, you're not just part of the Australian rock scene. You know, you do the most beautiful ballads and um, you've got this a corking sense of humour and you've got the band and there's, there's just, there are so many different aspects to you. And um, and you are showing us different things in there. But how do you view you in social media? It's really kind of going back to what we were starting talking about a while back. I I want to know how it feels being you right now within it. And, and never mind the mushroom, which is just going to keep on going. Mm. What do you want to give out on social media? And where's your where's your home? Which is your greatest home on social media? Uh... Well, social media wise, I just, I've, I've had actually, if I'm being really frank, I really, in a lot of ways, I sort of despise it, actually. I really sort of, you know, I sort of wonder whether it's got a little bit of that element of the house always wins, almost like oh. a way a casino does. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's really the way that I sort of see it. Now, that might be not working in my favour in terms of increasing the numbers, but, you know, I sort of do realise elements of the sort of addictive nature of, and the reward mechanism of like, you know, if it's just all about that getting bigger and bigger, then you can apply that to the way that success works too. It's like, well, if you can't, you know, we just, back in the old day, it was like, well, how how many plays are we getting per week on radio? And it was like, well, you know, you can, you can get to the top of that, but then there's another poll that you need to do. And then the same thing happens with chart positions. And back then it was actually how many copies were getting shipped to the 
the stores and then, you know, you'd be bummed out if some of them were returned. And then, you know, so there's sort of that nature of, I think that's very much ingrained in, you know, I think the social media uh, app designers and app sort of marketers understand the psychology of human nature of that way and the reward mechanisms and how that sort of dopamine hit works. And I think there is an inherent thing there that people are having meetings about that we don't, we're not privy to where they're, they're working out ways of sort of maximising and collecting the data. And, you know, I know that's a bit of a sort of, you know, there's a sort of weird uh, big brother sort of thing that I'm sort of talking about here that seems to, you know, I'm sort of thinking about all these weird, you know, movies that were maybe made in the 70s where they were talking about technology as a bad thing and look at, you know, like, I keep thinking of Yul Brenner in Westworld in 1973, you know, the, Michael Crichton who wrote uh, Jurassic Park as well. He actually directed a movie where, you know, they people went to these theme parks and there was Westworld. Obviously they've made a new show about that, but this was the actual feature film back then. And, you know, the, the robots went bad. And, you know, you know, technology, you know, I, I, I probably am conditioned by some of that sort of old school yeah. stuff, but I think... But if you actually look into, I guess, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theory sort of person, but I think that I, I'm not sure. My, my place in social media is uh, I, I think I'm probably very underutilising what I could be doing with it if I really sort of had more of a plan, to be honest. Yep. But then I sort of also see some of the futilities of where these things go if you just sort of take them to their natural ending. Yep. And I always come back to, well, if I'm spending all my time doing something that isn't putting my hands on the keyboard yes. and hearing a, a G13 with a flat nine sound and going, well, that's a beautiful sound and where do I go from there, you know, then I guess, you know, I don't want to be spending my time doing things that don't really give me that as I get older in life. But at the yes. same time, there's been these countless and indelible opportunities to meet new people through the social media thing and it's a sort of I guess it's a bit of like you know necessary evil is the word okay and that's how I sort of see it and partly that's been how that's been almost an inspiration in how wacky I can be on that stuff sometimes because it's a it's a response to how ridiculous the whole thing is but don't, that's magic, so, though, because that's a real response. That's an authentic it is. That's, response to, yeah. to the life that we are in. I really like that. So in a way, it's a, I feel kind of thankful that, you know, it, it's gone this way because it is, it, you know, to respond to that, you do actually end up creating interesting responses to it. And, yeah. you know, if it's bringing people some sort of like, you know, the, the whole thing is it's, it's an intangible thing that it becomes tangible once you actually stand in a room with people who are at your show or, you know, there's ways where it actually becomes a, a realised thing. Yes. Um, and so, but I guess on the way there, there's that intangible thing of like you really don't know how or who is really watching, listening and, you know, that's kind of one of those strange things that it, it feels quite isolated at the time in a weird thing because... It's words and comments and it's not as, I don't know, it just doesn't feel as real to me as it used to be when we stood in rooms and that was the first time you sort of heard the music. No, that's really true. Um, but in the same way that getting into a room and giving something, um, even on social media, I think as long as we do it authentically yeah, and as long as we're really thinking about, well that we don't necessarily need the likes, but we're giving something authentically because we're just feeling it right now. And so here we yeah, go, I'm just gonna give you this thing. Then I think that's, I think that's all right. Um, yeah, I think it is too. And I mean, look in the same thing, we're, we're on totally opposite sides of the world, but I'm actually looking at you and you're looking at me and we're talking. I mean, it's, I know it's not, we're in the same room, but we, we effectively are. And this, you know, this virtual world does give you, it gives you audio and gives you visual. And, you know, this is really, it creates real stimulus in your in your brain. So it does. And haven't you found that um, you have conversations with people that you've met um, in a virtual way, in this kind of a way, and then you meet them, and then you realise that it kind of does feel the same. It really does. Yeah, I mean, it does. I know that when we see each other, we're going to feel like we've seen each other before. I and mean, there's no yeah, doubt absolutely. in my mind. And that is a weird thing, and that's a miraculous thing. Um, 
as far as social media is concerned, I think that's slightly different because obviously we're choosing what aspects of ourselves to give. And then that comes back to the whole idea of actually who are we and what are we giving out there? And um, is it 3D enough? And I think one of the reasons why I really do love you is because you are you give such a 3D idea of, of who you are because you can do so much. Well, look, it's, uh, I think, thank you very much, by the way. This is very, very flattering and humbling and, and I really am, uh, yeah, I, I'm very sort of, it's just I'm I'm just really happy that we got to do it so early on because obviously I it's almost been quite quick because I've actually been sort of in the orbit of and I think Jacob and and me have been in this strange orbit yeah. and because we're sort of I'm not over in Europe as often as maybe guys like Lewis are and they work with different people I'm quite busy in Australia with various other projects and and my own band and all of that stuff but you know and and it did feel very it was crazily natural when I met him as well, of course. It was like, well, it was just like hanging out with the guy we've always hung out with. Yeah. But then, you know, this is, yeah, so I, I really feel very grateful that we, we get to hang out here so quickly and it was really lovely for you to, to reach out. And I guess, um, yeah, you know, I, I kind of hope that this is, it might even be an inspiration for me to, yeah, just, be the tip of the iceberg of a new sort of batch of stuff that might even sort of pivot in a new way. And I think I who think knows what that'll happen. sound and look like. You know, back in the day when Spotify first came about and you'd have your, you'd have a shared playlist with people um, yeah. and you'd, you'd go for it for a bit and then you'd stop. And they'd they'd stand there like limp lettuces. These these playlists, and you'd never really go back in there, and you'd feel quite sad looking at them. Um, and I've really rediscovered that again recently, and um, it's great having you know just a couple of people in your life with mm, whom you just mm. are just you're just going to be feeding. You're going to be feeding the whole time because yeah, it makes yeah, you yeah. realize, and it makes you remember, and to go back to the Alan moments yeah. or the Keith moments, and to just remember how golden they are and how they've stood the test of time, and how yeah, yeah I need to I need to share this just right now all over again. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to send you some stuff. Yeah, please do honestly, and I'll, I can do the same thing because I've yeah, I'll go do the. Uh... Uh, the other thing is, I've got another laptop that actually has, you know, it, it, it was the one that I got in 2012 and decided that because I didn't want to sort of get in the whole subscription update rigmarole all the time, I just left it as a sort of music production computer in its archaic oh, sense, you know, okay. it's sort of like relic old sense yeah. and just didn't upgrade any operating systems after a certain point um, because, I, you know, I had another laptop to use as well. So I was kind of like, this one's just going to sit in this thing. And it was more that the files are going to live natively on the actual hard drive. Ooh. So there was sort of, you know, I mean, this is crazy that referring to this is like, they're still just ones and zeros, aren't they? But they're yeah. actually like stored on this one hard drive. And I thought, well, that'd be a good thing to go back through because there's going to be a different sort of mental game to play to go through those folders because... Well, one, they were from an, an earlier listening stage than a lot of the Spotify suggested, algorithmic sort of suggested stuff, which it's is, true. it's unbelievable. But It is unbelievable, I think it's, yeah. it's one step back to the, uh, you know, the sort of the, the, the childhood record collection where you really, like, you cared, like you were making sure that if you just lost that physical CD. Yeah. You were going to rummage all around to find it. You know what I mean? Or oh, totally, yeah. If it, if it broke, you'd be it'd just be the end of the world. You know. Yes. Oh, or if the tape got chewed, you know this kind of stuff. So. Do you remember undoing cassette tapes? Oh, with a pencil. Yes. Oh, a million times. Yeah. I mean, it's of course. actually when I was finishing uh, high school because my dad taught uh, at the school that I was going to, and he was teaching languages and basically a lot of the Thursdays I'd be sort of doing gigs with this band. You know, the bass player didn't end up joining the band, so they said to me, you've just got to learn to play the left-hand bass sort of thing or, or I was kind of doing it and they were sort of like, look, we don't need to get a bass player, let's just have you do that. It'll just be easy to organise the gigs basically. So started doing that and then a few years later I ended up getting into recording some things with that band and, Ended up borrowing this uh, friend's, it was a six-track tape 
recorder. So it was just, you know, just normal cassette tape. Yeah. Um, and it was a bit better than a four track because you could sort of do four tracks and then bounce everything down onto the last two tracks. Yeah. And then you'd have four free tracks, which you gave you a lot of <laughs> That's latitude, amazing. You know? I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. So that was sort of opening me up to the idea of multi-tracking. Before that, I'd just use two, uh, two cassette players and yes. literally just sing along with the cassette yes. onto the other cassette. So just analog sort of multi-tracking that way, which is unbelievable, you know. Yeah, but we and, used and to do was, it. We used to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was so basic, but it was sort of. And I mean, what about the amount of tape hiss that would, you know, compound? It would. But also, you remember when um, the cassette would break and you'd get your pencil there and you're thinking, holy moly, this really has to go back together or else, you know, I'm really screwed. You know, this is a lot of spaghetti, but it's got to make sense. So you do this thing. And obviously, um, that means that for... I don't know, 30 seconds, two minutes or whatever, you've got a whole lot of crinkled tape, but that was another sound in itself. Totally. Yeah. You know, and it was amazing to yeah. have that sound. And it was always, it was like a, it was like a scar. It would say, yeah, you remember? You remember, matey, when you had to get the pencil out and you had to mend me? And this kind of <laughs> is because of that experience. Something to yeah, be proud yeah, of. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I remember the, yep. I remember the old technologies. I mean, I, you know, the first, uh, pop rock sort of band album with Thirsty Merc that I did, we actually recorded it all on 22, uh, 24 track, two inch tape. Nice. So that was like, you know, in the, in the proper sense. And it was one of those experiences, which I really, I really adored it actually, because it, it slowed everybody down from the idea of just being so impulsive. Like, let's just hear the guitar solo again. Oh, let's just go to the front end of the thing. Oh, let's go to the next song. That, that, that sort of the linear nature of, having to be forced and the producer just in Melbourne, he was basically just one of those guys still doing that. And it was great because, you know, you'd get to the end of the take and it'd be like, just like go back to the front of the thing. But that, that sort of time to hear it all going backwards, but then have to wait sort of 20 to 30 seconds each time. was amazing. Come on. It's amazing. Yeah. it, it, It did something for the creative process where, you realised, was it the cumbersome nature of that that made sure that your next take was going to be good? Or yes. was it the destructive nature of not being able to edit to that level Both. that made sure that you were sort of on you were on notice and you had to sort of play it or sing it right? Well, Or was it the fact that the tapes were so expensive at $450 Australian a roll and they only fit 15 minutes of music if you were running them at, you know, 15 inches per second that... You had to either buy more tape, and the record company didn't want to do that. No. Or you'd have to cull one of the takes and be kind of like, Got to you know, it pretty ruthless about it. Oh, yeah. You know, so that made the musicians have to. I mean, I, the question for you is do you think that's a lost art that people are, or do you think people are getting better with the way that people are learning? Because that's the other thing that's becoming incredible. I mean, I'm seeing. You know, I've made the joke. It's a silly hyperbole-based statement. But, you know, people tell me about, you know, there's an app. You can isolate the bass line. You can isolate the guitar. You know, any the drums on their own, and it's almost perfect. You know, now I know how these kids are doing, and I just write back, you know, look, these days the technology is so good, you don't even need to be born anymore. You know, <laughs> these, these apps thing? just, you know. So is it sort of getting to that point where, you know, two-year-olds are playing slap bass better than Flea from the Chili Peppers, you know, like, not is it, real or is it not, yeah, or is that not actually true? Are they sort of getting some parts of the technique and not the other stuff? Cause... That's right. They're hearing things and um, they're understanding groove in a, in a way that I think we would have taken a long time to get hold of. But Mm. we've talked about history at least twice in this conversation. And near the beginning, you told me that things go in a a great big kind of shape. And um, so, you know, we're going to be getting maybe somewhere in our lifetime, we're going to be getting into somewhere where we're going to be doing things in a really different way. Yeah. And without a doubt, there's always the kind of retro thing, isn't there? 
So it's really yeah. cool. It's really good, cool to have tape. Is it really cool to have um, the two inch tape? Well, that's mega cool. Um, you would need yeah. some money, I think, to do that. But it's all coming back because it's a different kind of a process. And when you were saying, you know, is it this or is it this or is it this that makes it so that we kind of do a good take? And I don't mm. know. That's a great. Those are rhetorical questions because I don't know the answer, but I do realize that it's a very different feeling, isn't it? when you've got logic up there or whatever you happen to use and you mm. know you can put down any amount of tracks and you can just yeah. wipe the whole lot or you can just say i don't like any of that i'll come back to this after dinner it's going to be different or i'm going to wake up in my um in my hotel room the next morning and i could just do it all again because you and you can really mangle it to to you can just mangle it to sort of your heart's content i mean you can stretch it out change pitch on it you know just it's just to automate anything and everything. It's just endless. It's unbelievable. Well, here's a good example because you've been with the gorgeous Metropole and I love the Metropole and I miss them so much. I really love them. I have so many friends in, in, in that beautiful orchestra. Um, were you in Hilversum? Yes, right, in, uh, okay. at the MCO where they sort of right, have so their headquarters. I, I love that place. Um, yeah. And when we were doing Jacob's first Jesse album, um, yeah. it was an orchestral one. And so we were all there and I, and I was playing in there. I was lucky enough to play on there. And, um, oh, that's awesome. and um, then we got to a solo that I play in Once You, which is one of the tracks. Um, and we did it one evening. But actually, the recording wasn't, um, I think there was something that wasn't happening about the system. And Jacob was really super worried when we got home. And he said, oh, man, you know, I think we just may have to do this all again. And I said, we can't do it all again. We're in your room, for heaven's sake. And he said, no, let's have a look at this. And he's got a plug in that means that I can sound like I'm in that particular studio in Hilversum. OK. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because we decided, OK, well, I'll do it. And I, I put it down a few times. And in the end, you know what? We used the one that we took in Hilversum because even though um, it wasn't sounding exactly as he wanted it to be um, with regard to the entire sound, I was mm. there and we were feeling it at that moment. And we knew that was the one. So yeah. it's, after having everything really polished and it was really great doing it in here and it was really perfect yeah. he went back yeah. to that one and i think that's really interesting a that there's a possibility of bringing hilversum into this house but b that there's nothing like yeah just being there and, and like what's playing. what's great is that i can see this sort of the beautiful union that you you and he he have and his sort of you know beyond his years uh insight to sort of or, or foresight to sort of know that there's that you know i guess we in pop songwriting demos would call, maybe call it demo-itis where, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a bad thing where you can't get away from the thing. But then there's also the sort of this is almost reverse demo-itis where that's right. you try and re-demo something that's already been done. But then, you know, it's like a great mastering engineer, for instance. They, they're the first to say my job is actually to know when to not add more. Yes. Because a lot, of, a lot of us artists and someone with the energy of someone like yourself or Jacob, might be like me, you know, almost don't know when to put the, the paintbrush down. That's right, because you just want but to keep it, on drawing, yeah. Yeah, but the great mastering engineer gets the mix and instead of having their ego involved or whatever and say, well, I have to do something on this, otherwise I'm not worthy of getting paid, they can actually say, you know what, this is just literally so already there that my professional you know, sort of work is actually going to be about not messing it up. Yeah. And 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 in music, it's it's always a funny thing, isn't it? Because I guess if you if you go to the you know the the MoMA in New York or or any great art museum and look at some incredible stuff, it's all about that imperfection and the realness of seeing that the that that wasn't a print and that wasn't done with a you know that was actually someone doing that with a with a hand painted thing and right. some of that stuff can i mean that can be completely created on computers these days you know that are very people draw things on tablets and actually do things on ipads and create a much more organic you know posterized look or a painted real look you know than you'd you'd think could be done with computers yeah um but i think it's all about just getting that sort of uh you know i guess it's because humans aren't humans are the ultimate not perfect soft machine you know aren't they so we don't relate to things if they've lost that sort of element of that and i think that that you know when you when you get something that's sort of unless it's done for effect 
yeah. you know, for deliberate effect to kind of create contrast against the realness of life, yes, which will be its own effect yes. and that will have its own outcome. You know, I think humans get their emotional uh, familiarity by having something that's just got that, you know, it's like a relationship. The perfect relationship is the one where, I don't know, is there, you know what I mean? It's like it's, yeah. it's, it's people trying to reconcile points of view and, you know, you're hearing something. It's like, well, it's such an endless complex thing that's in there, brain, heart, mind, bloodstream, all of that working together. How can you, you know, you're responding to something as an imperfect thing. So you want sort of something that's got soul to it. And that's, I, I think, like it. You, know, you can't put a maths equation on that. And, you know, I mean, the problem is I think these days they're almost getting close to doing that, but then you get into uncanny valley, of course. Uncanny valley. And that's, a, that's another thing. But don't you think going back to the kind of production thing and there's you with the, the two inch tape and, um, the, the kind of almost the pressure of having to be brave and to just step up to the plate and to do a good take. Um, and then if it isn't completely perfect, well, then we've kind of run out of time and, and tape and all the rest of it. Um, but I think production wise, I think we've gone through a, a, a real phase of things sounding really, really perfect, like really, really yeah. perfect. And I think, yeah. we're, I think we're, I think it's broadening now. I think it's great. I think it's, yeah, you know, I think we're coming, so. We're coming back into kind of one takes and um, let's just do this thing and or one yeah. mic. And um, I think it's really refreshing because you're right. We're imperfect as, um, as beings. So we're going to, we're going to really, really reflect best when we uh, when we look at something that is so-called imperfect but beautifully crafted because it's given with authenticity. Yeah, that's what it's about. That's the key. And I mean, you know, people can write a self self help course on, you know. But I've I've said it before. You know, if there was a kind of inspiration kit, and it was as easy as that, you know, I'd have just put it into a little kind of thing and I'd sell it at supermarkets for nine ninety nine, and I'd be a billionaire. But I don't want to also do that. It's just you sort of want to, you want to not know how that works. You don't want to over. That's right. That's just my thought. You want to leave it in some sort of mystical element because otherwise it's just, you're just, yeah, you're not getting the, the heart-mind combination mixture yeah, right you know? the heart gets left out all the time and where's the soul anyway so yeah and you can hear, hear the soul. fear oh uh, you can you know? hear the fear yeah well, it needs to be on the grid to the point that it's like well now it's just you're just doing that because you're scared of it not having something else look at that yeah we haven't even started to talk about fear um we have so <laughs> many things to talk about you realize we do have so many things to talk about and i can't i can't wait to find out what you're going to be inspired to to kind of do like like tomorrow i really want to know you're going to wake up and i wonder what you're going to feel like doing so you're heading to melbourne i think it's one of the most beautiful and wonderful places on this it earth. is it's fantastic I think if you've got yourself a place there, then you obviously feel that that's really the case as well. Um, how many more hours have you got before you get there? Uh, there's about three hours of driving and then, but I'll do that tomorrow. I'm going to get a yeah. good sleep. I just got back from the Netherlands, so I've oh, just no, been sort of jet lagged. I, I cannot believe you. Um, and yet we've had this conversation today and it's just, it's really, really epic. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Susie. Yeah, well, yeah, well, absolutely. We're We're going to be... I'll come and paint some eggs at, for supper at some point as well. It's got to happen, boy. <laughs> <laughs>